Uh, this is Dan Schneider. On this Dan Schneider interview, the subject is Russia. Uh, I am speaking with Charles Ziegler, and we'll be talking about the last few hundred years of Russian history and politics. Charles Ziegler is my guest. He is an expert on uh, modern Russian history, and we will be talking about Russia, especially in the last couple of hundred years. So welcome, Charles. I like to give all of my guests a minute or two to introduce themselves. Uh, so if you could give a little bit of background about yourself and your interest in Russia. Well, I'm uh, actually more of a political scientist than historian, although I, I think you have to understand the history of a country uh, in order to understand its politics. I got interested in it a long time ago when I was an undergraduate at Purdue University and then pursued that in graduate school at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, and have been working on various issues on Russian politics. Uh, first book I did was on uh, environmental policy in the Soviet Union. Uh, the second book was on Russia's relations with East Asia, actually Soviet relations. Um, also, I've worked on Central Asia. I have a book out on civil society in Central Asia. Uh, been to Kazakhstan a number of times in addition to Russia and um, have traveled throughout Russia and so on. Uh, worked a lot on foreign policy. Uh, I did do a small book on Russian history years ago, which is more for a general readership. And I'm currently working on a book on the question of why Russia never became uh, a major power in the Pacific region. Mm. So um, before we started, I was just talking a little bit about uh, your expertise. So we'll focus on the last couple of hundred years of Russian history, uh, sort of uh, uh, the 19th century, the getting to the end of uh, Tsarist Russia. But before we do, um, let's just talk a little bit about Russian identity. I'd mentioned to you that uh, uh, the modern Russian identity uh, uh, was sort of forged out of some Slavic tribes melding with or what it was called the Rus, or would have been some Vikings that came uh, from Scandinavia. And I, I found it interesting that uh, uh, in modern times, most people look at Russians, really ethnic Russians, as Slavic, when I guess genetically they would have probably at least as much uh, uh, Germanic or Scandinavian blood in them as a lot of uh, the Germans and uh, people of Scandinavia. Uh, what What is does a Russian... How does the modern Russian look upon themselves? Do they see themselves as, I mean, I know they, they don't see themselves as part of uh, Europe in a sense, that they see themselves as apart from them, but ethnically, how do they view themselves? Well, that's a big question. Um, Russians, in a way, have a sort of an identity crisis. Um, generally, if you look at the culture and the history they've been linked uh, more closely to Europe than they have to Asia. But there's a whole strain of sort of Russian identity politics that talks about uh, links to maybe not East Asians so much because they don't have much in common with Chinese or Japanese or Koreans, but Central Asia, uh, of course there's a Mongol influence uh, when the Mongols in the 13th century swept through the region and overthrew the uh, state of uh, Kiev, Kiev and Rus. Um, and so you do have a mix of peoples, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, the Mongol Tatar influence, uh, Germanic influences. Uh, but still, yes, Russians are a, an Eastern Slavic peoples, uh, like Belarusians and Ukrainians. Uh, their languages are pretty similar. Uh, they are distinct from, say, Western Slavs like Poles and, and Czechs. Um, what I think is especially interesting, though, is where Russians see themselves now. Uh, as I mentioned, they have always, well, at least since Peter the Great, uh, identified as Europeans. But I've had Russians tell me that, especially since the crisis with Ukraine in 2014 and the annexation of Crimea, they feel that they're not welcome as part of Europe mm -hmm. anymore. And officially, this is when Putin really began a, a turn toward uh, East Asia. Uh, they already had a close partnership with China, uh, but this has become even closer in recent years. And of course, uh, Europe, along with the United States, have sanctions on Russia. 
I think there's a perspective of Russians that, that they just have never been fully accepted uh, as being European, and there's a resentment of that. Uh, one other thing to mention in talking about identity, which I think is really interesting, is there's a difference between the idea of being Ruski and being Rosyanya. Ruski is more an ethnic term. It means you are ethnic Russian as opposed to being Armenian or Tatar uh, or Chechen or something like that. Rosyan is more a cultural uh, identity that says, well, even if you're, if you're Jewish, if you're Tatar, uh, if you're Ukrainian, as long as you buy into this sort of vague notion of Russian culture and you speak the language and you value the literary heroes and so on, then you're part of this broader notion of being Russian. Uh, it's, it's not exactly a civic notion like we have in the U.S. Mm -hmm. where if you come to the U.S., you assimilate, you speak English, you become American, uh, and you can be you know, Chinese American, you can be Uzbek American. Uh, this idea, uh, Rosiania, is a little different. Um, and it's that's what the regime claims that they're trying to do at the present time. That's what Mr. Putin would say he's trying to do, is build on that notion of Russian identity, rather than the more narrow, uh, sort of jingoistic idea of Ruski. When we think of uh, Russians here in the West and in the U.S. especially, you know, there's just like with Irish, there's this idea that they're always drunk, uh, there's, they're, they're depressed because they're up in, up in the north and it's, it's winter half the year, that there's also kind of maybe, a, uh, especially when you look at the literature, that there's kind of a, a self-loathing that Russians have and that they're always depressed and life is going to get them. Um, is that a fair assessment of the way the West views them? And do the Russians themselves have an inferiority complex compared to Western Europeans? Well, I'm not sure if that's a, a fair uh, portrayal of Russians. Uh, I mean, Russians, you know, you're talking 147 million people. And just like you say, Americans, there's a big difference uh, among people, uh, depending on their background, where they live in the country. Uh, yes, Russia's always had an issue with uh, alcohol consumption. Uh, it is a big thing. But I know there, you know, having traveled to this country now on and off for a number of decades, there's been a real change. I mean, during communist times, uh, there was always, you know, break out the bottle of vodka or two uh, at lunchtime uh, and get plastered. Uh, but newer Russians, younger Russians tend not to do that. I mean, they, they tend to be more hardworking. Um, if you look at the statistics, uh, things like uh, Chardonnay and, and Champagne have now surpassed vodka mm -hmm. uh, as a drink of choice um, for you know, young professional Russians. So uh, change is, is happening there. Mm -hmm. In terms of, sort of the pessimism and so on, that's often seen as a characteristic of, of Russians. Um, and I, I think there is some of that there. Uh, but again, I think these stereotypes tend to be uh, overdrawn uh, in the West. You know, uh, I don't know if you're aware on YouTube, uh, in the last few years, there's been a number of uh, YouTube videos and uh, of Rus young Russians, especially, doing these daredevil things like climbing skyscrapers and taking selfies or doing these insane kind of dangerous things. And a lot of young people have fallen to their deaths or fallen off of cliffs or, or, or whatnot. Right. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that, but that also does seem to play into this idea that this there's a, a deep sense of dissatisfaction in most Russians with the state of the modern state. Is that due to Putin or has that always been? No, I don't think it's Putin at all, really. Uh, if anything, you know, people were, or Russians were really happy to see Putin come in and establish uh, some stability uh, to develop the economy. Uh, most of them have uh, a lot of respect for him, and he's really pretty, uh, pretty well regarded by most Russians. Um, things like climbing skyscrapers or, or other things, I don't know if there's, um, I, I wouldn't call it a death wish among Russians, but I think they are, in some respects, more willing to take risks. 
than Americans are. And there isn't, uh, you don't really see the sort of helicopter parents that we have here in the U.S. Um, and yeah, Russians are, are in a way, I think, more willing to take risks personally. Uh, in, in business and the economy, not so much. Because if you do that, you try to start a new business and so on, you're going to get swamped by the big guys, and they're almost always guys. Uh, and it doesn't mean oligarchs, but uh, you know, business over there just doesn't function according to a rule of law like it does in Western democracies. And so if you're successful, the chances are you're going to be bought out or pressured into uh, selling. Uh, you're not likely to be killed the way you might have been in the 90s. But it's still a really rough environment, and most Russians will avoid taking risks economically, but seem to do so personally. Um, um, and that's impressionistic. Yeah, um, a lot of people have described the, the Putin uh, era as sort of gangsterism as opposed to uh, the communist state. Uh, famously, when Yeltsin was still around, there seemed to be a wanting to go back to communism from a, a at least a sector of the the Russian people. Uh, is is communism well behind them, and do they look up to Putin as uh, you know the the founding father of this new Russian state? Well, that, that's another one of those big questions. So uh, I'll try to answer it um, and not be too verbose about it. Um, when communism collapsed, you have to realize that the 90s were really a, um, a rough period for most Russians. A lot of Russians were thrown out of work. Uh, those who were working didn't get paid for months at a time. People were out, you'd find them on the streets selling whatever they had, old shoes or uh, you know, brick a brac that they had in their homes trying to make some money. Uh, inflation, the first year after the breakup, was over 2,000% in 1992. 93, it dropped to 800% and then did continue to go down. But just breaking away from that centrally planned economy uh, resulted in, in all sorts of traumas. Uh, you had the rise of these gangs. Uh, it wasn't just one type of organized crime, but all sorts of different gangs that would uh, extort money from the new businesses uh, that were brutal. A lot of them came from the former military or security services. Uh, and I've seen these guys in, in Moscow and Vladivostok and different places. They're not people you want to screw around with. Um, Mr. Putin came in, it was brought in by Yeltsin, and the timing was very good for him in that when he was elected president in 2000, March of 2000, um, the economy began to recover in part because of policies he put into effect, uh, like lower tax rates, flat taxes, and so on, um, but also because it coincided with a tremendous rise in oil prices from 2000 to 2008, uh, when we then had the Great Recession. So he was lucky in that that money was used to pay off much of Russia's debt. And um, Russians saw, you know, seven, eight, nine percent growth uh, during that period. And so compared with the chaos and anarchy of the Yeltsin years and a leader who, you know, in Yeltsin was uh, drunk fairly often uh, in public, uh, you had this younger, tough guy who came out of the KGB. Uh, who cleaned up the rebellion in, in Chechnya, uh, said he was going to waste him in the outhouse, and uh, Russians admired that. Charles, let me uh, pick up uh, and go back about 150 or so years. The last few decades I want to talk about of serfdom. Um, serfdom originally what started in what the 15th or the 16th century, it lasted a few hundred years, and uh, then, you know, everything started to come in to a head uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so let's talk about, is there still a, a kind of uh, almost surf mentality in Russia or has that long gone, faded away as well? I don't think there's a surf mentality. I, I wouldn't go that far. I would say there's a mentality in Russia that, um, that the government is aligned with um, the 
nobility, if you will. I think that's a, a um, piece of history that's been carried over into the present time. In this case, the nobility are the oligarchs, uh, the rich people. Uh, some of those are in the government. People in government enrich themselves. Uh, and so you have a, a great deal of overlap between the economic wealth, uh, economically wealthy people and uh, government officials. And that's very much like it was in Tsarist times where you had the nobility, you had top ministers and so on, who were basically allowed to support themselves uh, through forms of corruption, basically uh, milking the population. It was actually called kormlenia, which means feeding. Hmm. So if you were a top bureaucrat or a regional official, a uh, member of the nobility, you lived off the population. Uh, and that was something that was beyond the control of most of the population. They just had to um, suffer through that. I think there's still that mentality in Russia. And that is, well, it doesn't matter whether you vote or you go out and join an interest group uh, or something like that. It's really not going to make much of a difference. Yeah. Uh, now, some people do that. Uh, some people vote. There are people, I mean, we see protests because people believe their votes don't count. That means that there's some concept of democratic accountability there. We see protests of truckers opposed to, um, you know, uh, new taxes. We see uh, retirees who are out there protesting because they're trying to raise the retirement age. Uh, and all that suggests that this isn't, you know, set in history. It's not, they're not a captive of it. Things are changing. But those sorts of, of cultural dimensions change pretty gradually. Uh, how about, if we're talking about uh, czarism, um, how about anti-Semitism and pogroms? I know my mother was of Lithuanian descent and she uh, was born in America, but then uh, her parents moved back to Lithuania for a few years. This was uh, uh, right after Lenin had died. This was the 1920s. Stalin came up and then they came back to America because they were scared shitless of uh, Stalin. Uh, they weren't Jewish, but... Uh, they did. My mom often did tell about how uh, Jews were treated in Lithuania by the Russians. Is there still a, a, a strong strain of anti-Semitism in Russia? There, there is, and uh, you know, unfortunately, um, as in in much of Europe, Eastern Europe in particular, I think you see um, anti-Semitism still. Uh, the pogroms you mentioned happened at the end of the nineteenth and early uh, beginning of the twentieth century. Um, Jews at that time were mostly concentrated in what was called the Pale of Settlement, which would have included what's now Lithuania, uh, eastern parts of Ukraine, and so on. Those were the, the areas of the shtetl, um, and that's sort of what you see when, when you watch Fiddler on the Roof, that sort of notion. Yeah. Uh, and the pogroms were, you know, as portrayed in the film, you might have uh, local officials, you might have uh, Russian Orthodox priests and so on who would encourage the people to burn down Jewish homes or uh, chase them out of the village and so forth. Um, it was actually one of the factors that led to a decline in, in U.S. relations with Russia, which happened well before communism came about. You know, Russia had been a strong supporter of the U.S. for 100 years prior to that. Uh -huh. That was one factor that led to a decline in our relations, uh, you know, in the beginning of the 20th century. You saw that through the Soviet period. Uh, Jews were not completely excluded, but it was um, policy to make sure that they were not overrepresented in certain areas uh, of science, education, uh, and so forth. And then with the breakup of the Soviet Union, that, it, you know, during the Soviet period, it wasn't politically correct to be anti-Semitic. Uh, but now there is a strong Russian nationalist movement. And that would be the, the people, like I said, who pro promote the idea of the Hrusky notion, the pure Russians. You know, they talk about a Russia for the Russians. They're the ones who don't want to have anything to do with the Chechens or the Tatars who are Muslims. Uh, and they're also anti-Semitic. And so we see the growth of these, what are basically neo-Nazi groups uh, in Russia now. A small percentage of the population, uh, and you know we have it here in this country too, yeah. 
but still, that is an ugly aspect of uh, Russian political culture. But it is distinctly limited. How how are the Soviet leaders viewed now, from Lenin to Stalin through Brezhnev, uh, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, and then the, the last few guys before Gorbachev? I mean, is Lenin uh, viewed well? Is Stalin looked back in his, or do people now say, well, you know, we know that they were son of a bitches. Uh, how are they viewed? Uh, well, you have some pretty good questions. That, um, it, it varies. Communism as a whole, I think there's some nostalgia among older people for the communist era because things were predictable. You didn't get paid much, but you didn't have to work hard. You knew you were going to get a pension of a certain amount. So some older people look back to that as kind of a golden era. The individual leaders, um, and, and a lot of this, the tone for this is set from the top. Uh -huh. So what Putin has tried to do is say, look, let's focus on the good parts of the Soviet period, uh, downplay the bad things. So what you would focus on would be the uh, victory in World War II. Uh -huh. It's called the Great Fatherland War. Yeah. And I just saw a Levada survey, the uh, uh, public opinion survey firm over there, that found when they asked people, what are you most proud of? Uh, in Russian history, and 89%, far and away, the vast majority said the victory in World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, Putin has really worked on that, and so they see that, they see the accomplishments in space also. Uh, that was the second most uh, important thing for Russians. For leaders like Lenin, um, I think they don't really pay that much attention, certainly not the Khrushchev or Brezhnev. Uh, Lenin is not viewed all that well. Stalin is in a way seen as uh, a bit of a hero because he was the leader during the uh, victory mm -hmm. in World War II. And again, the government has tried to whitewash uh, some of the things that Stalin did with the, the gulag, the labor camps, uh, the repressions and so forth. So that something like half of people, uh, when interviewed, will say, on, on balance, Stalin was basically a good thing. Mm -hmm. But no one really seems inclined to go back to uh, anything resembling what the Soviet Union was like. Yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned uh, similarities with the rise of fascism, neo-Nazism in the U.S. and uh, Russia. Um, in a similar way, the U.S. often whitewashes its own history, whether we're talking about slavery or the genocide of American Indians or even things like experiments on the Tuskegee Airmen or, or things like some eugenics projects that the government carried out and the, you know, Hoover and the, and the FBI surveillance, all this kind of thing. Um, when people in Russia look back, are they even aware of things such as like the Ukrainian famine, what the Holodomor they call it, or as you said, the gulags, or have they been sort of purged from history? Well, I'd say a, a lot of students are not getting um, all the details on that uh, in the textbooks. And there has been this move against what they call falsifying history. Uh, for example, downplaying uh, the Soviet role. And they, in a way, they've got a, uh, a point there because in the West, I mean, the U.S., people in the U.S. have no idea uh, about how many people in the Soviet Union were killed in World War II. Uh, I tell my students it's something like a hundred times the casualties that we suffered uh, in that war. And it impacted so many people. And they often don't get credit for that. Um, so again, Putin wants to play that up. But then things such as a famine, which impacted Ukraine, as you said, uh, Kazakhstan, something like 40% of the population of Kazakhstan uh, perished in 1932 to 33. Um, other aspects, the fact that even Stalin, though Stalin won the war, uh, he was one who set up uh, the conditions for the rapid invasion. Uh, of the Soviet Union by the Nazis and ignored warnings yeah. that they were about to attack. So again, it's a, a selective approach to this history that students are getting now. And I think a lot of them don't, like a lot of students here in the U.S., uh, don't understand um, sort of the, the 
the things that you mentioned, the development of the KKK during Reconstruction, um, it's, it's either glossed over or just not taught in schools anymore. So I think young people are not getting a, a, uh, a clear picture of what life was like in the Soviet Union. Um, how about, you mentioned the space race. Um, uh, certainly, they. I'm sure most people are taught that uh, Russians were the first to, to get into space and whatnot. Um, how do they view something like the moon landing? Because most Americans nowadays uh, look at uh, the space race as basically just being a sidebar product of the Cold War here in the U.S. and I guess in Western Europe. Uh, do the Russians, do they acknowledge that we landed on the moon or do they believe in some of this stuff like the fake moon landing by Stanley Kubrick? I mean, is there that kind of nonsense? No, no. no. Um, well, you've got uh, Russians like conspiracy theories even more than Americans. Yeah. But I think most of them also respect science, uh, unlike a good chunk of Americans, uh, and realize, yes, we made it to the moon first. Uh, of course, we've had the cooperation, remember, ever since uh, Apollo Soyuz, that goes back to 1975, the cooperation there. And, you know, after the end of the Cold War, we were basically doing all our space launches out of uh, Baikonur in Kazakhstan uh, in cooperation with the Russians. Mm. So they are still, um, I wouldn't say really the top leaders in space, but they, they have uh, that expertise and they're trying to play on it. They again, resented that they had to go to the Kazakhs in order to uh, use the facilities. And for this reason, they built one out in the Russian Far East that would be on their uh, territory. Yeah. Um, I know you had mentioned the gulags. I just want to ask a little bit about if people know about that. But also more recently, you know, Putin has been famous for poisoning some of his rivals, uh, whether they're uh, political rivals or whether they're uh, journalists. Uh, you know, um, what that also plays into the whole idea of a gangster state and is there's that continuation of these reigns of terror, uh, so to speak. Do people in Russia, are they afraid to speak up against Putin now? Well, not really. Uh, again, it's, it's a complicated situation. Uh, you mentioned the poisonings and there have been a number of those. Uh, it's apparently done by, uh, in large part, by military intelligence, uh, the GRU in particular. Uh, these guys are good at that. Uh, does Putin give the orders for that? I don't know. Uh, but you mentioned a gangster state. I don't think that's really all that um, inaccurate. In a way, it's like, you know, the Mafia Don says, well, it would be nice if something happened to that person. <laughs> and then the underlings go ahead and they run with it. Yeah. Uh, that's probably how that happens. Average Russians, no, they're not going to worry a whole lot about that. If you're a real activist, like this guy, I'll say Navalny, uh, who's been on this anti-corruption kick uh, for several years now. Uh, I mean, look, he was recently poisoned. He's been attacked several times. Um, you have to have a lot of courage to step out that far the way that Navalny's done to publicize corruption uh, in the government. Mm -hmm. But there's always strength in numbers. And I mentioned earlier, uh, over the past few years, you can see waves of protest. Uh, 2011, there were big protests over uh, what were seen to be rigged elections and the castling move where Putin went back to run for president and Medvedev. Uh, stepped down and became uh, prime minister again. Mm. Uh, tens of thousands of people out in the street. The retirees that I mentioned, the truckers, there have been demonstrations against uh, environmental uh, destruction, uh, waste dumps here and there. So Russians are not afraid to go out uh, and protest yeah. against that. So again, this does not suggest a society uh, which is completely beaten down. It's not like the Soviet period. Uh, people can travel, people can get alternate information in, in the uh, internet. Uh, everybody has cell phones and they use them to mobilize for these protests. Mm. So no, the government doesn't have complete, complete control and it hasn't uh, a cow to everyone in that, in that society. I like the chess turn castling between Medvedev and uh, uh, Putin. But uh, I wanted to ask, you mentioned earlier about China. And, you know, famously, when uh, the Chinese Revolution took place in 49, uh, Mao eventually went his own way. He didn't 
really like uh, the Stalinist or the Soviet method to communism. And then, of course, after he died, uh, it's been 40 plus years of quote unquote loosening up. And, but still, the Chinese are nominally uh, communist. You mentioned that Putin has gotten closer to China. Could it be that uh, uh, Putin's influence might uh, help bring about the end of communism in China, do you think? Uh, do, will they see the, any gains that Putin has made and say, you know, maybe we should go more Putin-esque? No, no? Uh, not at all. No. What you have there is a, a partnership of uh, convenience, I think, in that both countries are determined that the U.S. should not be calling the shots internationally. Uh -huh. uh, they also agree that one should not interfere in another country's affairs, which they see the U.S. to do, and which, honestly, we do around the world. Um, it is, Putin isn't going to uh, suggest to the Chinese any other ways of doing things. The Chinese economy is somewhere around $14 trillion uh, in absolute terms, and Russia's economy is at about $1.6 trillion. So the Chinese are doing much better than the Russians. They don't think they have much at all to learn from the Russians. What they have learned is that you don't want to loosen the political screws the way that Gorbachev did, because then the country could fall apart mm. and they could lose Tibet, they could lose Taiwan, they could lose uh, Xinjiang province or Inner Mongolia uh, or even Manchuria, and they sure don't want that to happen. So what you see is uh, Xi Jinping's continuing um, the reforms that Deng Xiaoping started, uh, but with more attention to state you know, large state firms and protecting those uh, and really keeping uh, repression down politically because they don't want anything to happen to China along the lines of what happened uh, to the Soviet Union in the form of the breakup. Well, you, it's interesting you mentioned Gorbachev. Uh, uh, it seems to me from what you're saying, is he sort of viewed as a failure? Is he sort of like the Jimmy Carter of modern Russia in that you know, he his incompetence led to the breakup, or do they think that's actually a good thing that he did that? No, he's uh, detested, even more than Jimmy Carter is, far more. Um, I think in a popularity poll a while back, it was like one or two percent of Russians approved of Gorbachev. Uh, he is, he's very widely seen as being uh, the guy who was behind the collapse uh, and he's not admired at all in Russia, far more admired in the West uh, than he is in his own country. And is that because they think things were, is because things were better when uh, the Soviets were in charge? Or uh... Well, some probably because they think it's, things were better then, but I think a lot of it is because they had this large superpower. It was uh, the biggest country in the world, uh, nearly 300 million people, um, 11 time zones, and so on. And then that all fragmented. And instead of being a co-equal superpower to the United States, uh, they became what um, some people used to call uh, upper Volta with nuclear weapons. Um, and they were, you know, they went through that terrible period in the 90s, poor, out of work, and so on, disrespected internationally. Uh, and that's been a big part of what Putin has done and where he's been so popular is that he's restored Russia as a great power. I just saw in the news this morning that they are now opening uh, or have gotten port facilities in Sudan. Uh, so that gives them another port in addition to the one in Syria at Tartus. Uh, you've got Russian mercenaries operating in Africa, um, Russia partnering with Iran and Syria. Um, good relations with Israel, uh, good relations with Saudi Arabia. So Putin has done quite a bit to restore Russia's standing in the world. And that is a source of pride for the Russian people. Uh, Gorbachev brought an end to all that. And I think that's why he's not respected. So, uh, Charles, uh, I want to pick up a little bit on the Russian-U.S. narrative that obviously we know about uh, 
the Cold War. And uh, I don't think there's really much we can say uh, that hasn't been said 10,000 times before. So let's talk about uh, U.S.-Russia history of the last 30 years post-Soviet Union uh, from Yeltsin to, you know, the, the supposed Trump connection uh, uh, and election meddling, et cetera, in 16 and supposedly uh, this year, possibly. Um, uh, does Russia still uh, view itself against the American prism in a sense that America is is the dominant military power? Even, you know, we can talk about China, but still America is, is still number one, if we want to use a term like that. Does, does Russia... Uh, do they plot their moves uh, with American uh, American mind? Do you think? I think so. Yeah, it's a, a very important relationship. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, early in the uh, Yeltsin period, say for the first three or four years, there was the idea that you know, wow, the Cold War's ended. Uh, we're going to be friends now. Um, and Russia would develop into a liberal democracy like the U.S. Um, but then that, that very quickly changed. And in terms of its national interests, by the mid-1990s, uh, a lot of people were saying, well, look, we shouldn't have you know, severed all our ties like to Cuba, to North Korea. Uh, we need to build up ties with China. Uh, and also there was a, the idea that the U.S., didn't really want to assist Russia, uh, but simply wanted to exploit it. And I, you know, I was going to Russia a lot in the 1990s, and you really got that impression that uh, that the West and especially the U.S. we were trying to make money off of Russia. Uh, we were trying to proselytize. You had whether it was you know Seventh Day Adventist groups or Baptists or whatever religious groups coming over, trying to win converts. Uh, we were selling uh, chicken wings, uh, Snickers bars, all that stuff. And so a lot of Russians figured out that, you know, we didn't really care that much about them. We were simply taking advantage of Russia, uh -huh. uh, which in a way I think we were. That's not all that wrong. So by the time you get to the late 90s, a number of things started happening that really drove the point home. And the big one was our bombing uh, of Serbia in 1999, um, when the Serbs were doing ethnic cleansing uh, in Kosovo. Uh, and that was a major turning point because the Russians saw that as US and NATO being willing to violate other countries' sovereignty, uh, not taking Russia's interest into account. Uh, and if you think about it, that really coincided with Mr. Putin coming into uh, prime ministership under Yeltsin, which was August of 99. Uh, and then, of course, uh, March of the next year becoming president. Um, when he came into office, he was pretty well disposed toward the U.S. Uh, he was hoping that we could build a relationship when we were attacked on 9-11, Putin was the first one to call Bush and offer assistance. He was, uh, and actually overrode some of his military advisors to say that Russia didn't mind if we established bases in Central Asia, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, and Uzbekistan to pursue the war in Afghanistan. Uh, but then we, you know, against uh, Russia's advice and wishes, uh, went into Iraq in 03. Uh, and then you had the color revolutions, as they were called, yeah. Georgia in 03, Ukraine in 04, Kyrgyzstan in 05. Uh, and it looked, it, and then in 08, uh, the U.S. and the Bush administration is really pushing NATO membership for Georgia and Ukraine, uh, which were right on Russia's border. And we had been moving NATO further and further eastward. And so you can track this deterioration of relations over that that period uh, to the point where then in, in uh, 2007, Putin gives this very vitriolic speech at the Munich Security Conference that the U.S. is running amok in the world, basically uh, violating international law and ignoring the interests of other countries. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of a, a little capsule summary of the 
the path by which our relations deteriorated. Of course, after Ukraine in 2014, um, they only got worse. Yeah. How much do you think that has to do with the USA still wanting to use Russia as a scapegoat? I mean, uh, the last two presidential elections, of course, there was people talk about Russian interference and whatnot. Uh, do you buy that, that? I mean, I don't think that had anything really to do with overturning or getting Trump elected or getting him defeated this time. Um, but it seems to me a very lazy narrative that we're going to blame Russia again when the U.S. doesn't want to look inward the, at the way, you know, it treats its own minorities, cops killing black men at random, the COVID, uh, uh, before that, you know, global warming and, and us not doing a damn thing to even lead the world against global warming. Uh, so do you think it's a lazy narrative to uh, blame Russia? And are they right in that sense? No, I think you're right on the lazy narrative. That's a kind of a good way to put it. If you remember a little while back, I said that uh, our hostility toward Russia started prior to communism. Mm. did an article about this a few years back, looked at the history on that. Um, it started in the late 19th century and it was there before communism. Um, and it survived communism. And it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's irrational, but politicians, I think, have learned that being anti-Russian plays pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, and so Russia does get blamed for a lot of things. Now, uh, in a lot of respects, Russia can be a bad actor. You mentioned the poisonings of journalists and, yeah. and uh, dissidents and so on. Um, a look at what they did in Syria, helping Assad butcher uh, thousands of his people and drive them out of the country. Um, it's... You know, there are a lot of negative aspects to the country, but still, I think there is this sort of irrational, almost uh, attitude toward Russia, certainly uh, in uh, the official U.S. Now, mentioning Trump, I think one thing he, he tapped into, it's really surprising to me, too, during the 2016 election uh, and afterward that you see a number of people who would have been the staunchest anti-Russians or anti-communists previously, uh, now admiring Mr. Putin. Uh, why? Because he is not politically correct. Mm. Uh, these are the same people, I think, who like Mr. Trump. Uh, because he is overtly religious, you know, he aligns himself with the Russian Orthodox Church. He defends uh, conservative values. He's against uh, same-sex marriages. Uh, he's against sort of the, the uh, radical liberal uh, values of Hollywood. Uh, and so that, that plays well with Russians, a good chunk of the Russian conservative population. And it plays well with a good chunk of the conservative American population. Mm -hmm. And I think those were the folks who supported Trump. And so Trump's um, close ties to Russia and the fact that he never said anything negative about Mr. Putin and was very reluctant to say anything negative about Russia, uh, it kind of falls into place, if you yeah. understand that. Yeah, well, Senate Leader McConnell has been called Moscow Mitch uh, more than once online. Um, let me uh, talk a, a bit, though, about, uh, I mentioned global warming. Uh, you know, here in the U.S., we, we have... Uh, fracking in Canada. There's the, the Alberta shale that's being ripped up for, for oil. Uh, Russia has a lot of oil reserves and they famously or infamously, once the Arctic is ice free, they want to go drilling in the Arctic Ocean. Um, what does Russia, is Russia uh, as bad uh, in terms of acting uh, or reacting to global warming as the U.S. has been? Uh, I mean, are, are they just totally oblivious to the possible consequences of such? Well, you have some uh, interest groups in Russia who do push this. I mean, there are Russian, there's Russian Greenpeace. Um, there are environmental groups. Um, the problem is they don't have a whole lot of clout. Uh, but then, of course, environmental groups haven't had much clout in this country for the past four years either. Um, and they often have trouble in this country, I think, fighting against industrial interests. But Russia does have uh, huge reserves of natural gas, the largest in the world. Um, and while they don't have the largest oil reserves, they do have a lot of it. As you mentioned, a good chunk of that is up in the Arctic. Uh, and they are developing that. 
it's difficult with the sanctions, but uh, they are looking forward to exploiting that. And then the use of Northern Passage as the ice melts uh, to shift uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas, uh, out through that region. Of course, Russia has far more icebreakers than we do, and that gives them access to the um, re ready access to the markets in East Asia. The government itself, um, very little concern there about the environment. Sometimes they'll make noises about it. Um, but by and large, again, if, if Russian uh, powerful business interests want to exploit an oil field uh, or want to cut down a forest to build a road or a factory or whatever, uh, they usually don't face much opposition. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough road uh, for environmentalists in that country. Well, and it was, in, it was in the Soviet Union, too. Like I said, my first book was on Soviet environmental policy, and the environment always took a backseat to industrial development yeah. uh, in Soviet times. Uh, Chernobyl is no longer part of Russia. It's, uh, I believe, in the Ukraine, or is it Belarus? It's in Ukraine. It's in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but one of the other great uh, natural disasters uh, of the last uh, half century or so has been the decimation and shrinking of the Aral Sea because of uh, water being siphoned off. And a lot of people have talked about this century, uh, there possibly being uh, fresh water wars between countries. Uh, um, do you, how does the average Russian, does the average Russian even know about the disaster, the natural disaster of uh, the Aral Sea? They probably have heard about it, but you know that is not really part of Russia anymore. It's Central Asia, mm. uh, so Central Asians would know a lot more about that. Um, the Kazakhs did a, a fair amount of work to try to restore the flow through the two rivers, Yamudari and Sirdaria, that flow into the Aral Sea, and uh, they've had some success. But the the dictator of Uzbekistan. Uh, really was very uncooperative with it. Now, he died several years back, uh, and the new president of Uzbekistan seems much more attuned to uh, international opinion, more willing to work with others, so we might see some real progress. Uh, there was some, given what the Kazakhs did to try to restore the flow, so you know, I, I would like to be optimistic uh, about that. For most Russians, it's not really an issue. Uh, Russia has a lot of water, a huge river system, uh, but they also have polluted water. Uh, so that would be more of the issue there. It's not so much the supply you can find in the U.S. West, Middle East, or Central Asia, but rather it's contamination. Well, we've talked a little bit about the recent past. Let's uh, talk about Russia going to the uh, forward in the 21st century just a little bit before we end. Um, but before I do that, let me just talk, though, about what does the average Russian think about the Soviet period? You know, someone uh, once wrote uh, that uh, Chinese communism, when it finally falls, presumably, will be seen as just another of the Chinese dynasties. Do people look back at uh, Soviet Russia as just sort of a weird 70-year detour from Mother Russia, where they got all these other countries together? And now, do they, do they feel better that that it's Russia rather than, you know, Russia and Kazakhstan and Ukraine and the Baltics, et cetera. Uh, what, what does the, the average Russian look back at the Soviet era? Do they look at it, you said a little bit as wistfully, but I mean, do, are, are they satisfied where they're going, the, where the country is going? Well, again, I think older Russians, uh, meaning probably mid fifties and up, uh, have a nostalgia for the Soviet period. Um, younger Russians don't really care. Uh, that was something in the past, just like you know, younger Americans. If you ask them, oh, well, about, what about the 1950s? Or yeah. what about the Depression era? You know, a 20 something, a 30 something is gonna say, what, you know, why should I care about that? It's ancient history. And I think younger Russians would feel that way. Um, going forward, I think in a way it may be easier for Russia because it's no longer the really diverse country it was before. You know, when the country broke up, only just over 50% of the population was ethnic Russian. 
I think it was 50.4 percent, and all and that other 49.6 percent were Ukrainians, uh, Armenians, Belarusians, uh, Uzbeks, Tatars, um, you know, Kyrgyz, uh, Moldovans, and so on. Now you have a much more homogeneous country. It's about 82 percent Russian, uh, and so you can build on Russian nationalism, which you really couldn't before. Mm. Uh, and so the idea of a, a more nationalistic Russia backed by the Russian Orthodox Church, that's a big part of it too. Uh -huh. So many Russians have a really positive view of the church. Um, Is the church though know, a convenient stooge for Putin though? No, it's not seen that way. No. Uh, again, it's seen in national terms, I think, as a, a representative of uh, Russia that's been there for a thousand years. Uh -huh. So there's respect for that. And you know, the different ministries uh, now have their own Orthodox saints uh, and the Russian military just built a huge Orthodox cathedral outside of Moscow uh, to you know dedicate it to the patron saint of uh, of the Russian military. Yeah. So uh, you see an interesting blend here of nationalism, militarism, uh, and Russian orthodoxy. That's, I think, what we're going to see going forward. So I mentioned uh, the U.S. and a lot of people. Uh, I know I'm I'm someone who would be considered someone on the left, but I'm 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 someone uh, what of a disaffected centrist. I mean, I'm I believe. Uh, in progressive values and, and whatnot. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I just look at um, the average American being so lazy, they don't want to vote outside of the two main parties. Uh, things like ranked choice voting are sort of sneered upon. Uh, does the average Russian look at the U.S. and say, well, we don't want to be like that. So uh, what happens post-Putin? Because Putin is, what, 71 or 72 now? Let's say he dies in the next decade. Um, is there a is there a post Putin plan in Russia? Do you think they're going to fall into liberal democracy, or will they revert to something more like the Soviet state? Well, I'd, I'd say neither. Um, and Putin is only sixty eight. Okay, well, and it's close to seventy. So, uh, I mean, that's one year older than I am. So let's hope that uh, you know a sixty eight year old can can hang around for a while. You know, with the constitutional amendments they put in uh, earlier this year. Uh, he could stay in until 2036. Uh -huh. uh, would he do that? I don't know. You, you hear rumors that he's kind of tired of the job. Uh, he's sort of laying back and, and letting the ministers and, and other top officials around him handle it. Um, he's a little more disinterested in the whole process. And, you know, I can understand that. After 20 years, sure, you get tired uh, of that. The, the thing about this is you, you've at least got the apparatus in Russia of a um, constitutional state. You have a constitution, you have a legislature, the Duma, uh, you've got constitutional rules if they're going to be followed. Um, and so all that could go into play if Putin decides to step down or if he would die or something like that. Um, but that doesn't mean there wouldn't be a struggle behind the scenes for power. Uh, that it's not a, a fully constitutional rule of law democracy. And so the powerful forces behind Putin, the ones that he juggles, the Siloviki or the, the top power ministries from the army, intelligence, tax police, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, the economists and reformers and so on, they're all going to try to get their own individual person uh, into that office. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I doubt that it would be a really smooth process. Mm -hmm. uh, I could see some internal struggles among the different clans uh, within the Kremlin. So uh, it's hard to say. Would it revert back to something like the Soviet Union? No. Uh, most Russians see that as an experiment that failed dismally. Uh -huh. and don't really want to go back to it. Would they become an American-style liberal democracy? No, probably not. Um, what you would see is probably a continuation of what we have now, which is sort of soft authoritarian, 
uh, or what a political scientists like myself call an electoral authoritarian regime, which has, again, elections, has political parties, has a legislature, but where power is concentrated uh, heavily in the executive and where uh, the other institutions, including the courts also, are relatively weak and can be politicized and controlled by the executive. So do we see another Putin or is someone softer, perhaps like a Medvedev uh, waiting in the wings? Given the way politics work there, I think you'd probably see somebody who is tougher rather than someone who is softer. Uh -huh. uh, so you could see uh, somebody like Sergei Shoigu, uh, you know, Minister of Defense, uh, stepping into it. You might get somebody who's even more of a nationalist than Putin. Mm. So I said before, Putin likes to play on the idea of the Russiania uh, identity, sort of a broader sense of Russian identity, which brings in different ethnic groups. You could get a more rabid nationalist who says, you know, Russia for the Russians, and, you know, we're not going to tolerate these Chechens or the Tatars uh, or other, the small peoples uh, in Siberia. Um, and there is already a, a tendency in that direction. A lot of these groups uh, are being forced almost to, um, you know, abandon their native languages and, and to uh, focus on Russian language and culture. So you might see an ac acceleration of that trend. So finally, uh, what do you think is the, the current U.S. biggest misperception about Russia? And do you think uh, in your lifetime, or say by 2050, uh, that there will ever, that Russia, where will Russia-U.S. relations be? <laughs> oh, uh, prediction is always difficult, especially about the future, right? <laughs> um the biggest misperception, I think, that a lot of Americans still believe Russia is still communist. Mm. Uh, I still talk to people. And uh, you say, no, no, they tossed that out 30 years ago. Uh, you mentioned China. China still has a communist party, but it, it's got a mixed economy uh, with large chunks of capitalism in it. Um, so that's a big misperception. Um, Looking out to the future, I think, as I said, that uh, Russia is going to continue to follow a path of soft authoritarianism, nationalism. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems, let, let me put it this way, one of the biggest problems in U.S. policy is that we fail to recognize other great powers have their own national interests, and we're trying to cram them into a, a narrow box, if you will. The Chinese are not going to immediately start respecting human rights just because we criticize them. Doesn't mean we should give up on that, but we should be a little more uh, cognizant of our limitations as being, in being able to change other countries. And Russia is going to go its own way. Um, so, I think that our relations will never improve if we don't say, well, you know, we have to recognize, for example, that taking NATO close to Russia's borders and, again, proposing to bring in Ukraine or Georgia in the membership uh, is a bad idea because it is threatening to their national security to have a military alliance that close to them. Uh, I'm not sure why we can't realize that. Um, and that some countries uh, may want to have close relations with regimes like those in North Korea, Myanmar, uh, Cuba. Uh, again, I think our foreign policy often errs in trying to, uh, again, force countries to do things that we want them to do. Um, and obviously we're gonna follow our own interests. I mean, Trump was wrong about that. Every president has put America first. He wasn't the first president to do that. Uh, and actually, a lot of what he did was not good for America. Uh, but Russia is going to put Russia first. Russian leaders will. Uh, what we have to do is find ways to work with that, uh, cooperate where we can on things like climate change uh, or infectious diseases like COVID. Uh, 
uh, and yet respect that they may have a different political system uh, than we have. Yeah, well, all nations have problems uh, with uh, doing the right thing. You could just ask people on Native American reservations here in this country. But I want to thank you, Charles uh, Ziegler, uh, for uh, speaking for about an hour with me. I'll link to your university page at the uh, University of uh, Louisville. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I enjoyed doing it.